turn to his word, and then uh, we'll see what he has for us in Hebrews 10. So Father, we, um, we thank you for your word, and we pray that Spirit of God, you would do what you love to do, and that's reveal truth to us through this word. You, you love to make Jesus really big to us, and we ask that you would do that. Um, I ask for those in here who would say, I- I'm a follower of Jesus, he's my king. Would you help them, help me, to leave with a bigger view and a bigger picture of Jesus as we go? And for those who would say, I, I don't know that I believe this, I've got some doubts, I've got some questions, we pray that by your spirit you would speak to them through this word that you say is alive and that it's active. Would you do that? It's in your name, Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, one of my favorite movies growing up, and, and still is one of my favorite movies, is the movie Braveheart, where uh, Mel Gibson plays William Wallace, and he doesn't have a great Scottish accent, uh, but he does his best, and it's a really great movie. It's, it's one of those movies that, um, as, as a man, uh, I think about Braveheart, World War II, or the Roman Empire uh, at least once every other day. Like, I, I'm not joking. I think about one of those regularly. So if, if my wife is like, hey, you're here, but you're not really here, it's probably because I'm thinking about some aspect of World War II uh, or Braveheart or the Roman Empire. And so if, if, you are, if you're married and you experience your husband as a little distant, just ask him, like, hey, what World War II battle are you thinking about right now? And you'll, he'll probably give you an answer. Uh, that movie, it, in, at the end of it, it covers... One of the battles in the first war of Scottish independence, the Battle of Stirling Bridge, and in that battle, the Scots are outnumbered and outmatched by a united uh, a British army. The morale is low. So many of them are like, I don't know if this is worth it. Let's just kind of bow down to the Brits and serve them. And then out comes William Wallace, face painted blue, wearing a kilt, and he gives this just incredible speech. And he rallies the troops, and he, he gives this passionate speech to them about his desires for Scotland as a country and for the Scottish people. He just gives these incredible desires, and, and that speech ends with this incredible line, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. And uh, my, my son, Kian, got to watch that movie for the first time yesterday, and I, I'm like, this is the first of many times that you will watch it or think about it. Um, and it's just this incredible thing. And I was thinking about that movie and thinking about my desires for you. My desires as a pastor for you as the people of God. And, and I wish that you could know the prayers that I pray for you week in and week out and the desires that I have for you. And there's two primary ones. And one is, and I, I'm not, I thought about coming with my face painted blue wearing a kilt, but, but old Jackie Morgan wouldn't let me borrow his kilt. Uh, I want to see Christ formed in you so desperately. Um, Paul talks about this in Galatians 4. He tells the church, like, man, I'm in the pains of childbirth, which is interesting because I know ladies see that, and you're like, oh, really? You are. You know what that's like, Paul, huh? It's like, no, man, I, I've, gosh, I just want to see Christ formed in you so desperately. And then um, my second desire would be I want us to walk with a view towards generational faithfulness. More and more, the older I get, I care less and less about what happens in this church and what, how, how big we get or don't get. I, I care less and less about that. What I get really excited about is thinking about your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids and my children and their children and great-great-great-great-grandchildren. There's this verse in Psalm 102 where the psalmist is, is telling the people of God, hey, recount all the works of God, write them down, remember them, so that a generation yet unborn might praise your name. That's what I get really excited about, thinking about generations from now, people who say, man, I, I love and follow Jesus, and my family has loved and followed Jesus for as long as I can remember. I don't even know where it started. And, and maybe for some of you, like, you can look at the Murphy side of my family and see generational faithfulness way back before we came to America. But maybe for you, this is the moment. It's like this time, you would say, actually, in, in my family, there's generational cursing and people who don't love and follow Jesus. And what I want so desperately is for like you to be the person that Jesus rescues and a whole new story is told in your family. Those are desires I get, I get excited about. And how that happens, how do those two things happen? Christ formed in us. We walk in a kind of generational faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 3.18 
Paul says, hey, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. When when the Bible uses that word behold, it's not look at it once and then carry on about your life. It's, It's the language there is look at Jesus, keep looking at Jesus, don't stop looking at Jesus. That's how this, these things happen. Beholding the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And how that happens, how we're transformed by this as we together behold Jesus is as we gather as a church and we scatter as a church. We gather on the Lord's Day like we are now to remember the gospel, to declare it through song, to be reminded of it as we come to the table, to hear it as we hear from the word, and then we scatter as the church of God with that gospel in our hearts, on our lips as we go love one another and gather together. And what we're doing, uh, we started last week and we'll do this week and next week, we're taking a break from our series in First and Second Samuel to talk specifically about the scatter part of that. Like, what what does it look like to scatter as the church Monday to Saturday before we come together again as the church? So last week, we answered the question, why does the scattered church matter? Why does the scattered church matter? We saw that we've been saved, we've been uh, created for community by community, that God as One God, three persons, exists in community and creates us to walk in community together. We saw that God saves us individually. We're we're saved from sin, Satan, and death by faith in the finished work of Christ. But we're not just saved individually. We're saved into a family. And that God has sovereignly decided that it was through his church, those who say, Jesus is my king, these are my people, this is the mission he's called us to, it's actually through that that he makes his grace known to the world. And what we're looking at this week is if that's why the scattered church matters, what's the aim of the scattered church? Like as we scatter as a church, what should, we, what should we be aiming at individually and collectively as we do that? And we're going to look at this passage in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews was a letter that was written to Jewish Christians who, because they were experiencing persecution, there was a big temptation for them to say, let's pitch Christianity and let's just go back to what's familiar with us, to us. Let's go back to Judaism. So the author of Hebrews, we don't know exactly who wrote it, but the author is writing this letter to help Jewish Christians see, guys, Jesus really is better. He, he's the better sacrifice that all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they all point to Jesus. They're all fulfilled in Jesus. He, he's the better temple where you encounter the very presence of God. He, he's the better covenant. Um, He's he's the better revelation from God. He's going to tell us at the beginning of the letter that God spoke in times past through prophets, and now he's spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And what the passage is going to do is help us see the aim of the scattered church. But before we get to the aim, we have to know the foundation. So if you've done any kind of marksmanship or archery, you know it's really tough to get a good shot if you don't have a good foundation. You know if, maybe if you, you've been in the type of job where you're set up in a hide site, you know, like, if you don't have a stable position and your arms get to shaking, it's really difficult to have a good shot. It's really good, difficult to have good aim. So we've got to know the foundation that we're standing on before we understand what's the aim as we scatter. So what's the foundation of the scattered church? First, the two things the author is going to show us. First, We've been given bold access by Jesus. We've been given bold access. Verse 19 of Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when he says that, he's connecting all that he's about to say with everything he has said so far. He said, Jesus is the better sacrifice. He's the better temple. He's the better covenant. And all these things are true for those who would trust Jesus. And he says, therefore, because of that, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he's inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. We have been given bold access by Jesus. Well, bold access to what? What is our bold access to? He tells us to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Now, for a first century Jewish Christian, they would have known what that meant. They would have known the sanctuary. That's That's where the presence of God is in a unique way. And for them, that would have caused a bit of concern 
because they were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And in the Old Testament, here's the kind of feel you get from God. It's like this. Come close, but not too close. Draw near, but don't get too close to me. In the temple, there was a a, a normal place, and then behind this veil, behind this curtain, was the Holy of Holies. And that's where the presence of God during this time, it dwelt in a unique way, and only the priest could go in there, and only one time per year. Um, when, when God was speaking to Moses from on top of the mountain, he tells Moses, tell the people to draw near to my mountain, but don't come up on my mountain, don't touch my mountain, lest they die because of their sinfulness, because God is holy. So when, when the author is saying, hey, we now have bold access to enter the sanctuary, we should be saying, wait, what has changed? What's changed with the message here, which is come close but not too close, it's actually dangerous for you to draw close. Now the author is like, no, 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 bold access. Come on in to the presence of God. It's because of Jesus. When he says we have bold access through the blood of Jesus to come through the curtain, at the death of Christ, there's this really unique thing that happens. In the temple, the curtain is torn from top to bottom. And not by a human. This this curtain would have been 50, 60 feet high, very thick. Not something that we could have gone and like, let me rip this. And the word used is really intentional. It's not just torn in any unique way. It's top to bottom. And what God was giving a picture to his people of, of was that through this sacrifice of Jesus, when Jesus said, it is finished, he has paid the price for sinful people to be in right relationship with a holy God. And now that which divided holy God from sinful people has been torn top to bottom because the sacrifice to end all sacrifices has been offered. And that's why he's saying, come boldly now into the presence of God. We as a people can come into the presence of God with boldness. Not coming before him like, do I deserve to be here? Do I not? I know what's true about me and all these things that I've done. He says, no, no, because Christ's blood has been shed for you. You come before God with boldness now through the righteousness of Jesus in your place. And as we scatter as a church, we're reminding each other of that. We're recognizing in us when we're in the midst of sin or in the midst of shame where we're believing the lies of the enemy, God doesn't love you. You've done too much. You can't go into that place. If you go there, the whole place will burn down just by your presence being there. We're reminding each other, no, no, no. That was true before Jesus. But now because of Jesus, you come through his righteousness with boldness before the presence of God. That's the first foundation of the church. You've got to know because of Jesus. And if you don't yet follow Jesus, what's the offer on the table is, do you want to come before your creator with boldness? You can if you come through what Christ has done for you. That's the first foundation. Second foundation he shows us is that Jesus is our constant advocate. Jesus invites us to come with the bold access he's given us, and he's also our constant advocate. Again, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. For for Israelite people before Christ, there were these high priests who served as a mediator between God and people. So holy God, sinful people, the mediator between them was a priest who would intercede on behalf of the people. He would confess sins on behalf of the people in the presence of God. He would offer sacrifices to cover the sins of the people. And what the author is telling us is Jesus is now that high priest. He's our advocate. 1 John 2 says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And Jesus, if you're in Christ, serves as your constant advocate in two ways. Both are really important. We tend to veer towards one of these. He serves in a legal way as your advocate and a relational way as your advocate. In a legal way as your advocate, you have an enemy who loves to accuse you. Those things that you feel internally, 
I don't deserve to be in the presence of God. Jesus can't love me. I've done too much. If, if God really loved me, why am I going through this? If I really loved God, why would I do this? You have an accuser who roars those things in the courtroom of heaven as the prosecuting attorney. That's a way to think of your enemy. He's your prosecuting attorney who is laying out all that you have done so that the judge would give you the verdict of guilty. The prosecuting attorney is like, let me remind you of what he or she has done. And here's what Jesus does in a legal way as your advocate. Jesus stands like your defense attorney. And for every accusation the enemy gives against you, Jesus says it's already paid for. It's already been paid for. We ought not even be in this courtroom. That one's taken care of. He is a sinner. That's right. I paid the price for his sin. He does not deserve to be in the presence of God. That's right. I paid the penalty to give them bold access. Jesus serves as your advocate, as your defender, and he gives you permanent access. You're not in the courtroom anymore. That's been done. Jesus has declared you, if you've, if you've put your faith in Christ, he's already declared you not guilty, perfectly righteous. And the accuser may roar. And I think part of what Jesus does is our defense attorney is like, why are you trying to drag him back into the courtroom? The verdict's already been given. Not guilty, perfectly righteous. Because the guilty verdict has been placed on Christ. He dealt with it on the cross and he left it in the tomb. And he walked out of the tomb and says, it's finished. Those who would trust in me are innocent and perfectly righteous. They're covered by my blood. You shut your mouth. You need Jesus as your legal advocate, but he's also your advocate in a relational way. Hebrews 7, the author tells us that Jesus, as our faithful older brother, lives to intercede for us. What that means is, at this moment, and in every moment to come, and at every moment since you have trusted in Jesus, he lives to intercede for you. You know day in, day out, Christ is before the throne of God praying for you. Hey, that one's ours. She's ours. You shut your mouth. She's ours. He's ours. Um, him, le I mean, think about this. At your darkest moment as a follower of Jesus, when you have most believed the lies of the enemy, that you do not belong, that God could not love you, at that moment, Jesus was praying for you. And at your best moment, Jesus is praying for you. Hey, what we believe is by faith in the finished work of Jesus, our lives are hid together in Christ. God looks at you and I, if you're in Christ, and sees the righteousness of Jesus. Here's the good news of the gospel. It's not just that he gives you permanent access to the, to the presence of God with boldness. It's that you have the same access he does. If you're in Christ, your access to God is just as secure as Jesus' access to God. Now, I know you may feel like I often do. I don't feel that reality right now. And I think sometimes when we ask each other the question, how's your relationship with God? What's it look like? What we ought to say is, man, I'm struggling to give expression to it right now. I'm in a season where maybe I don't feel it like I always have. But I think our answer should be, sheesh, man, I don't know. How's Jesus' relationship with God? I think it's pretty good. <laughs> and if we're hid with Christ, that reality is true for us. And as followers of Jesus, we just struggle to give expression to it sometimes. We struggle to embody it fully sometimes. We struggle to feel deep in our soul the reality of what we know to be true because Jesus has said it's true, but it makes it no less true. And there are times that I answer it that way, and I know it's, I'm being a bit of a troll when somebody's like, how's your relationship with Jesus? And I'm like, I, or how's your relationship with God? I'm like, I, it's the same as Jesus is, and Jesus and God seem to be doing pretty well together. So as we scatter as the church, we remind each other of that often. We pray for one another. Like what would change in our lives, in our homes, in these small groups as we scatter? When we hear someone bring up, like, man, I, I just feel like such a failure 
as a mom, I feel like a failure as a dad. I feel like a failure as a follower of Jesus. What if in that moment, rather than saying, have you tried this? Would you do this? Maybe do this. We try to fix that problem. Maybe we just say, hey, let's just join Jesus' prayers. He's been praying for you before this moment. He knows all that you're carrying. He knows exactly what you said and the things that you don't even want to say right now. Let's just join his prayers. That's what we do as we scatter, as we scatter together. Jesus is your constant advocate, and what we do is remind each other of that and encourage one another with that reality. Now, notice the language that the author's using in Hebrews. Again, he says, therefore, since we have bold access, and since Jesus is our constant advocate, he's our faithful high priest, he's going to use the language let us three times to say, this is now how to respond to that. Now, let me pause and say, don't do the uno reverse on this thing, because it's what we do in the church all the time. We take the let us, this is now how we ought to respond, and we move it back here and view it like, guys, we have to do these things so that Jesus will give us bold, advocate, bold access and so that he'll be our advocate. Don't mix those two things. Order matters so much. It's why he says, therefore, because of everything I've said about what Christ has done for you, because of that reality, here's now how to walk it out together in the church. Okay? So don't reverse these things. I think it's one of the ways the enemy loves to just come in and twist things just a little bit, tries to convince us. You got to do these things so that you'll have access. Do these things so that God will love you. He said, no, no, because of your identity as a son or daughter of God, because of the blood Jesus shed for you, here's how to walk it out. All right, three things, three calls from Jesus to the scattered church. First, Jesus invites us to draw near. Verse 22, therefore, again, since we have bold access through the blood of Jesus, because Jesus is our great high priest, he's our constant advocate, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. He, he's calling us to draw near, to remember our baptism, to remember like, hey, there was a time when you, this is why it's so important for a follower of Jesus to get baptized. It's like we're giving testimony to what Christ has done for us. I've died to my old self. I've been risen to new life in Christ. Raised to walk in newness of life. He's saying, hey, because of those things, like draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. With your heart sprinkled clean. What that means is Jesus has dealt with the internal you. Not just the external ritualistic, I do the right things and I avoid doing the wrong things. He's, he's reminding us we can draw near because our, our hearts have been sprinkled clean. Jesus says all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, it's not enough that we just do the right things or avoid doing the wrong things. He goes for the heart of the matter. He says, you've heard it said that you, sh you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you've harbored anger towards your brother or sister in your heart, you have broken the law. Hey, some of you walk around and you're like, well, I've never, I've never slept with someone who's not my wife or a, ma a man who's not my husband. I, I've never committed adultery in that way. And Jesus says, well, you've, you've looked with lustful intent at a woman or a man who wasn't your wife or your husband. He encapsulates even the heart beneath that. And what God has done is he's actually changed our hearts. 2 Corinthians 5, we're new creations in Christ. The old has passed away. The new has come. Some of the reality of walking with Jesus is he changes us internally and our external being takes a while to catch up to that reality. He is day by day changing you from the inside out. That's why we behold Christ. We look at Jesus. We don't stop looking at Jesus. We continue to look at Jesus. And because of that, he invites us to draw near. Here's what that means for us. Uniquely at this church, we do not throw one another away. We don't give up on one another. We don't respond to one another in ways that Jesus does not respond to us. And when we do, we are quick to confess it. We don't, we don't throw one another away. What this also means is we don't let one another run away. When you recognize part of what should happen in these groups is just having a sensitivity because of the Spirit to a brother or sister who might be withdrawing, who might be running away because they feel like, I, I don't belong here. 
Nobody wants me here. If they knew me, they wouldn't want me here, so I'll just run away before anyone gets to know me. We recognize that. Like, brother, sister, man, I think the enemy is lying to you right now, and I want to remind you of what Christ has done, and I want to invite you to actually draw near to this group as we draw near to Christ. Part of what we do in these groups is we just remind one another, Christ has rescued you. Come on home. And when a brother or sister does come home, we don't sit there with our arms crossed, like, took you long enough, where have you been? We just say, welcome home. God's glad you're here, we are too. Jesus invites us to draw near. Second call from Jesus to the scattered church, he invites and empowers us to hold on. Verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope, the confession that Christ is Lord, that it really is finished. Let us hold on to that confession without wavering since he who promises faithful. And I know there's a bit of like a, see, there it is. I have to hold on. I have to do it. And some of you have walked with Jesus long enough and been honest about yourself and your story long enough that you would say, what happens when I don't hold on very well? What happens when I have these experiences, like Paul talks about in Romans 7, where he's like, man, the things I want to do, I want to love God, I want to love people, I want to hate sin in my life, I want to love what God loves, but it seems like that's the thing I don't do, and the thing I don't want to do is the thing I do. I turn my back on God. I behave with other people in a sinful way. I say yes to sin and no to Jesus. What happens when we don't hold on very well? Here's what I would tell you. Keep reading and read again. Let me read that verse for you one more time. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. The author of Hebrews anticipates us saying, I'm going to have difficulty holding on sometimes. And what he says is, Jesus won't. He's faithful. He never quits. He who began, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will finish what he started in you. And the process is so messy. And sometimes it feels like three steps forward and one step back. And sometimes you're like, am I any different at all? And we cling to this promise. He who began a good work within you will be faithful to complete it. And as we scatter as the church, we just participate together in the work he's already doing in all of us. He'll finish it. We participate with him. We open ourselves up to the work he's doing inside us and outside us. We're saved start to finish by faith in Christ's work, not in how well we hold on. And it's why he tells us, he who promised, he's faithful, man. You may lose your grip on him. He'll never lose his grip on you. Now, also notice, he doesn't say, you hold on. He says, let us hold on. The reality is you can't do this very well alone. How many times have you been like, man, I'm going to try, I'm going to do it right, I'm going to get up every morning, I'm going to read, I'm going to memorize scripture, I'm going to spend time in silence and solitude, I'm going I'm to, today's going to be the day, I'm going to follow Jesus perfectly. I've never found that day in my life. I love Jesus so much, and I so desperately want to honor him day in, day out, and I have yet to find that day in my life, and I have to remind myself, he who promised is faithful. He's faithful, and I can't do it alone. Because you, like me, when you get trapped in sin, or when you're hearing the voice of the enemy very loudly and the voice of Jesus very softly, you need a brother or sister who can remind you of what Christ has done. This is why we say the gospel, the good news of Jesus, what he's done for us, it's easier to believe on a brother or sister's lips than it is to believe in our heads so often. I can't tell you how many times when I've been in the midst of a shame spiral or just so discouraged because I'm like, I thought we were done with this. I thought I was over this. I thought I was through this. Why am I dealing with this same thing again? And I have a brother or sister who doesn't lay out, here's all the 20 ways to not do these things. He's just like, hey, bro, you're going to make it. God's for you, man. He's not going to stop the work he's done in you. Just turn around. Just turn around. Turn back to Jesus. We do this together. He will get us through. Third call from Jesus to the scattered church, he invites us to encourage one another. 
Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. He says, hey guys, encourage one another to love and good works. What that means is like nobody got scolded into obedience to Jesus. Nobody's ever been shamed into faithfulness to Christ. That's not what he tells us to do. He's not like, hey, go around and tell everyone, stop that, do that, don't stop that. Hey, it's encourage one another. Hey, man, you're already a son or daughter. Now you can walk as one. You're free to walk as one. When somebody feels like, man, I'm powerless against this lie in my life. I'm powerless against this sin in my life. We encourage one another. Hey, bro, God has sent his spirit to empower you. You're not powerless. He's actually living life within you. you. You have the life of the risen Christ in you. Don't believe the lie that you're powerless. You are so far from powerless. We encourage one another. I love that he says encourage one another to meet together regularly. <laughs> He's like, don't neglect to meet together. It's just so encouraging to me because even in the early church that we're like, man, if we could just do it like the early church. There are people in the early church who were like, dang, man, I want to sleep in. I don't think I want to go to church today. There were people who were like, I just got too much going on, man. I, I don't know that I can do this. He's like, hey, guys, don't do that. <laughs> Gather together, man. You need each other. And I know for some of you, even the word encouragement, you're like, Ugh, can you move on? I don't like that word. Some of you are like, I know there's some people who need encouragement. I'm not one of them. That's for other people. The author of Hebrews also says in chapter 3, encourage one another every day. As long as it's called today, I, I love that so much. I, I love the, the humor there, the sarcasm. Encourage each other every day as long as it's called today. So he's, he provides some freedom. If you find yourself on a day that's not referred to as today, you can stop encouraging each other. It's like, no, do it every day. So that you won't fall into the deceitfulness of sin. To the person, and I resonate with this, to the person who would say, I don't like encouragement, I don't need it, I'm uncomfortable with it. I say to you, you will fall into the deceitfulness of sin. There is a moment, you may be in the midst of it, or it may be coming for you, where the lies of the enemy will sound very rational to you. You don't belong. Run away. Blow this relationship up. You're going to hurt him anyway. And what you need is a brother or sister who's going to encourage you in that moment, who's going to lift your gaze, who's going to lift your shoulders and say, hey, man, God's not done with you. It's going to finish the work he started in you. So if you would say, I don't need encouragement, your problem's not with me, it's with God. God says you do. <laughs> and, and like Jesus rose from the dead, so I, like, I'm just going with his opinion. I'm not going to be to the guy who rose from the dead like, nope, I don't need encouragement. I'm going to be like, geez, I feel like I don't, but you rose from the dead, so I guess we're going with your opinion on this. Hey, let me also in- encourage you, as you're encouraging one another, don't do the thing where we're like, hey, I don't want to give you a big head. I don't, want to, I don't want to make you proud. Let me offer a little bit of encouragement. That's like, that's like handing a little kid a balloon and then me like, pop. You know, it's like, you're awesome, but not too awesome. I just want you to know. And we think, I think we think sometimes that it's our responsibility to make sure people don't think of themselves too highly. And we have verses for it. We're like, it doesn't Philippians 2 say don't think of, it, don't think of yourself too highly? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Each one of you in humility. Don't think of yourself too highly. Count others. Needs is more important than your own. That is in the Bible, but it's to us as individuals. My responsibility is to make sure that I don't think of myself too highly. It is not my responsibility to make sure you don't think of yourself too highly. So, and I think that's what we do. If we encourage one another, it's like, hey, I'm going to say something good about you, but before I do that, let me, let me just make sure you remember. <laughs> You're not that impressive. It's not our responsibility. Individually, we do that. Like, does that make sense? I just want to make sure. It is not my responsibility to make sure you don't think of yourself too highly. That's something that God calls us to individually. Okay, let me give you a quick summary before we talk about where we're headed with these groups. Um, The aim of the church as we scatter is we want to see Christ formed in one another as we behold him day by day. That's how we're changed, by the power of the Spirit. We do that together. The way that you are changed to look more and more like Jesus every day is by beholding him. That's the purpose of these groups. I 
I don't care very much about the percentage of people who are in groups. I don't care. It's like next year we need to have 40 groups instead of 20. That's what I care about. I want to see Christ form. All we're doing with groups is creating a structure where that might happen. And for you, you may have, have this somewhere else. That's okay. That's okay. Um, the foundation of the scattered church, we've got bold access through Jesus. He's our constant advocate and his call to us, how we respond to our identity and access is we draw near together, we hold on together, and we together encourage one another. Those are his calls. Now listen to me, before we talk about some of the group stuff, if all that you experience of Frontline Church is this Sunday gathering, that's okay. This is not the moment where I want you to feel some kind of manipulative pressure to do something more. You're saved start to finish by Jesus, not by how well you engage in community. But what Jesus does is he just invites us. He's like, hey, now walk it out. You don't have to do life alone. And I know there are some of you that even as you hear this, you're like, that sounds like a really beautiful aim. But John, I was in a church. I was in a group where I think we were aiming the other way. I think we were intentionally hurting one another. I think we were intentionally responding to each other in a way that Jesus doesn't respond to us. That all sounds good. That's not been my experience. Hey, it grieves my heart and it grieves Jesus' heart. You're not crazy to feel a bit timid to engage it. Some of the reality of doing this is it is going to be messy, man. We are going to hurt one another. That's why I just say let's commit. We don't throw each other away. We don't let each other run away. And when we respond to each other in ways that Jesus doesn't respond to us, we're just quick to confess it. We're quick to confess, bro, I talk to you in a way that Jesus doesn't. I expected something of you that Jesus doesn't. We're quick to do those things. So last week, we talked about the three different types of groups, small groups that we have at Frontline. We talked last week about connection groups, and, and this is for those who would say, man, that, I think the thing that I need right now is just relationship with other people. I just need to get to know some other people. I need to pursue friendship. We've got all kinds of connection groups that will be starting in September. We've got mentorship groups. I'm going to talk more about these next week. Mentorship groups, that's someone who says, man, I, I think I have particular grace from the Lord that I just want to deposit in other people. Today, I want to talk about the formation groups. Um, in, in a unique way, what these groups are doing is saying, hey, let's, let's behold Christ together while we pursue formation, discipleship in a specific way. We're, it's, it's like, hey, we're, we're following Jesus together and helping each other follow Jesus. So there's a handful of, of different ways in different groups that are like this. There's missional communities. Um, these are, if you've been in churches that have community groups, life groups, th this is kind of the, hey, we, we get together, we're going to pray for one another, we're going to disciple one another. These groups um, discuss the upcoming sermon text together often, and that's, that's an intentional thing. I think what, what used to happen is like, let's discuss the text that John just preached or some other preacher just preached. It's just like, what do you think about what he said? And we just swap that to like, let's talk about it before it's preached because you have the Spirit of God. You can hear from the Spirit of God as you, as you study Scripture. Um, and also, frankly, it, it challenges me in my sermon prep because I know, okay, there's folks who've, who've already looked at this. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't, uh, I need to have thought through this deeply because other people have this week also. So there's groups that meet on Thursdays, Hope Mills, Rayford, Jackbird area, Haymount area, downtown in Fayetteville. Um, uh, there, there's a group started by Alan and Kim Smith that's going to get together six times over this term, September to November, uh, looking at core Christian beliefs. And so if you are like, hey, man, I, I'm new to following Jesus. This is all new to me. Or maybe you would say, I don't yet follow Jesus. I've, I've just got a lot of questions about this still. Or maybe you're like, man, I, I've been following Jesus for a long time, and actually nobody has just sat with me and said, hey, these are the core things about what it means to, to love and follow Jesus. That'd be a great group for you to, uh, to jump into. Um, Aiden's going to lead a, a theology formation group. Um, that's going to be a, a deeper dive into theological work, and, and in this upcoming term, it's going to be looking at Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, and kind of where's Christ and all of that. Um, there's space, I mentioned this in the nine, so I'm sorry you didn't come earlier because it might already be taken. There's space for two more people uh, in that specific group. So if you're like, dude, that resonates with, with me a lot, you got, you got to find Aiden quick, and it wouldn't hurt you to offer some sort of bribery. Um, he likes hats, 
big Texas belt buckles and boots, you know, one of those, maybe just a blueberry muffin basket would help. We don't condone bribery, but there's spots for two people, you know, so. Uh, we'll also, in the future, in future terms, we're going to have this same, this same type of course. This isn't like a one-time opportunity. Liz Baker is going to be leading a group for ladies um, called Learning to Sit with Jesus, where they'll pour over scriptures together, they'll pray scriptures together, and then to kind of learn to write responsively to what Jesus might be doing in them. Um, and then also, there's an invitation, like, as you hear about this, Maybe the Lord's doing something in you that you're like, man, I, I want to get a group together and I, do a deep dive into this book of the Bible or into this theological book or, or into the idea of parenting or marriage or wh whatever that is. We, we trust as we give these ideas that the Lord's going to stir up other gifts as well. Um, and you can learn more about all these groups. You can see them on this small group site, frontlinechurchnc.com forward slash small groups. That QR code will take you there. There's also, if you're interested in, in hearing more about leading a group, there's a, a section at the bottom where you can complete a form and, and just talk with us about, you know, ideas that you have. And then I also want to mention the app is really important. Um, there's an app we use called Church Center where you can see all these groups. So you can download that, look for Frontline Church, and then at the bottom you can see my groups. You can see all the groups listed there, the times they'll meet, contact for the leaders, uh, so you can ask questions in there, and that's how a lot of those groups will be communicating with one another. So um, the, the app will be important. He, here's the invitation um, from us to you. Come again next week. Like these three weeks build on each other are really important. If you missed last week, catch up on our website or on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, and then spend time with the Lord just asking, hey, hey Jesus, what's your invitation to me or to my family in this. Maybe you would say, like, boy, the idea, like, I've been doing Bible studies and Sunday school stuff for a long time, but the idea of a group that j just intentionally is, like, pursuing friendship together feels, feels a little terrifying to me. Maybe there's an invitation from Jesus, like, hey, that's what you need. Maybe you would say, dude, I hang out with people all the time. That's all I ever want to do. The idea of, like, going going deep in a specific formative way or pursuing intentional discipleship, that sounds like... Maybe that's Jesus inviting you into that. Maybe as you hear this, you're like, man, I, I have a desire for a group that John didn't mention, and I'm just waiting for somebody to raise their hand and do that. Maybe that's God saying, hey, I, I want to invite you to, to potentially lead a group in this term or in an upcoming term. Um, consider that, that with the Lord. Hey, let me invite us to stand as, as Dan comes up here. Um, I want to read these last two verses from Hebrews 10 that we've looked at again. He says, Let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as is the habit of some, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When the author of Hebrews says that day approaching, he's, he's talking about the day when Christ comes back and makes all things new the day where heaven comes to earth and we rule and reign with Christ for all of eternity. There's a day coming where we won't have to say, hey, walking in community together is messy. It'll be perfect. There's a day where we won't have to ask forgiveness from one another because we've all been made perfect. There's a day where we won't have to confess sin to one another because we won't sin against each other. That day's coming. And part of what we do is we encourage one another. Hey, bro. Hey, sis. You're one day closer to that day. And if you're in here and you follow Jesus, you are one day closer than you were yesterday. Yesterday may have felt really long. You are one day closer to home. One day closer to when your faith will be made sight. Let me ask those who are serving communion to come down front. Part of the reality of being one day closer to that is if you are in Christ, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, hey, listen to me so clearly. This is for you, especially when, if there's something in you that's like, that's not for me. You're going to make it. Not because I have so much faith in how amazing you are, but because he who promised is faithful. He says, I'm going to complete the work that I started in you. He'll bring it to completion. You may feel like a failure, a disappointment, 
right now. God doesn't view you that way. And you will make it if you're in Christ. We're going to remember that as we come to the table. We're going to, this, this meal that we share, the Lord's Supper communion, it's a reminder of how I can, what ground, John, do you stand on to tell me I can make it? How dare you? Because your risen Savior, whose body was broken for you, and whose blood was shed for you says it's finished. That's the ground of my confidence. And he who said it's finished also says, I'll complete the work I started in you. So here's what I'm gonna ask you guys to do that are serving communion. As you, if you would say, Christ is my king, I'm trusting in him as my only hope in life and death. As you come, I want you to remember, one day Jesus is gonna serve you this meal. One day your faith will be made sight. Jesus is going to hold bread to you and wine to you, and he's going to say, let's feast together. And that day is one day closer today. So what I want you guys to do is as people come forward, just look them in the eye and say, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. That's how we encourage one another today. Hey, if you're not a follower of Jesus, here's how I want to ask you to engage this moment. If you're not a follower of Jesus, none of us can say to you, you're going to make it. The reality is, if you're coming to God in any other way than through what Christ has done for you, you're not going to make it. It won't work. Your good deeds, your 51% good life to 49% bad life, it will not work. you can walk out of here with the banner over your life being, I'm going to make it because Jesus said so. Consider this reality. God loves you. God isn't unaware of your rebellion and your sin against him. And what he offers to you in this moment is forgiveness and belonging and adoption and identity and security. But it's only through Christ. You gotta come to the king before you come to the king's table. But the king is calling you today. His invitation is, acknowledge your sin and turn to me for forgiveness. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from un all your unrighteousness. You can walk out those day doors today knowing I am a son or daughter of God because of the finished work of my older brother in my place, my future secure, I'm gonna make it. I would imagine that there are countless rooms that you walk into and feel like I don't belong. This doesn't have to be one of them. You can know today you belong. And it's through faith in Jesus. He's not asking you to do anything other than to acknowledge your sin and to turn to him for forgiveness. That can happen today. Don't leave. Don't leave without knowing whether or not you're going to make it. I'd love to talk or pray with you. We'll have leaders down front who would love that to do that as well. If you're a follower of Jesus, come to the king's table. And remember, you're going to make it.